Welcome to the Art of Procurement Podcast with your host, Philip Eidson. Here, thought leaders share the trends, strategies, and tactics that you can use to elevate the role of procurement and your career. Welcome to today's Art of Procurement interview. I'm coming here live from the SIG uh, Spring Summit here in Washington, D.C. And I'm delighted to be joined by Surab Gupta. Now, Surab is the Chief Strategy Officer at HFS Research. So, Surab, thank you very much for joining me. Hey, no, thanks for having me, Phil. I really appreciate it. And uh, we were talking off mic a little bit about your background. So I thought rather than me try to... uh, um, to portray that, you probably do a better job yourself. So I wonder if you could just share a little bit about, you know, how you came into the role that you are today at HFS. Uh, I was when I was born, I thought that I'll join HFS. No, I'm <laughs> yeah, joking. exactly. I'm joking. You, uh, you but, had a long set de- <laughs> desire to come and take this position. <laughs> uh, no, um, look, I, I've been in this uh, industry, call it the global services industry, call it the digital operations industry, for a very long time now, uh, and I've been in all different. Uh, sort of legs of the stool uh, so i've uh, i i've i started my career as a software engineer mm-hmm. um, with a service provider um, i then got an opportunity to be an analyst uh, mm-hmm. and there was at least um, uh, this was way back uh, when i actually started a procurement outsourcing research and right. then got into a lot of other uh, uh, at that time we called it bpo mm-hmm. uh, um, stuff from finance and accounting to HR to banking and all that kind of uh, stuff. Uh, I then got into consulting, the sourcing advisory space, um, for a long time working with a lot of clients. Yeah. Uh, sort of think through how to select vendors and working with the vendors of thinking through how to go to market. Yeah. Um, then I thought, uh, let me actually get my hands really dirty. Uh, so, <laughs> so I went and joined a client. Uh, mm-hmm. I was with a biopharma company leading their BPS, uh, business process services and okay. automation strategy mm-hmm. um, for some time. Um, I then thought the only the only piece that I'm missing is being a service provider. So yep. I did that. Yep. Uh, I was heading up... Uh, heading up strategy for the CFO services at, at one of the service providers. And then given all that experience, I thought, what is it that I really want to do in yeah. my life? And I thought being the analyst was the most fun, yeah. uh, especially in today's world, uh, which is, uh, I, I call it the VUCA world. It's volatile, it's mm-hmm. uncertain, it's complex, it's ambiguous. And I think being an analyst is not only safe, but it's also interesting. <laughs> you got to try and make some sense of all <laughs> that. Make, make some sense you. of all, it, all of it and uh, talk to a lot of interesting people. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I looked around and uh, I know Phil first uh, from a very long time and I thought that's one analyst firm which actually looks yeah. at the future uh, yeah. than looking at the fa- looking at the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not saying we'd always be right, but at least we try and uh, give market some yeah. direction. I thought that's the place to be. So uh, that's how I landed. Yeah, and I've, so I've been following Phil on the blog for I don't know how many years. It feels like <laughs> 10 plus years or yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's actually amazing to see what he's built over that time and how that's grown. Um, probably the most important question I had today, because it was on your bio, who do you support? Which You said in your, in your bio, it's, uh, there was a, a passage about uh, you're a European soccer supporter. So I guess the most important question for me is who are you following? Uh, I... I I was an avid fan of uh, Manchester United, mm-hmm. um, and I'm not sure anymore if yeah. I should uh, or should <laughs> not. So I'm I'm actually looking for a team yeah. uh, that I should support avidly now. Um, I know f- uh, I know some of uh, my colleagues uh, support Liverpool, mm-hmm. uh, so I want to be the devil's advocate and support somebody else. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but I'm still looking for it. Yeah, you just support a low-level team like me, and you never win, so you never yeah. have any expectations <laughs> to win. Um, so you just stick with them. Um, one one of the questions I had uh, as I was thinking about um, kind of directions for for the conversation today was to understand a little bit about what goes into writing a research report um, because it's something that you know of, obviously I've read tons of research reports I'm sure that most of the people listening to it have but we don't necessarily know what goes into the building of a report so I just wonder if you could share a little bit about kind of the process that goes into that end result yeah. So I think I think the the for me the even more important question is what is the topic that you want to write a report mm-hmm. on before you get into how do you write the report yeah. right because being an analyst in today's world is a very hard uh, job I, I I know everybody says that mm-hmm. that their job is the hardest <laughs> but but I, I think our job is hard too 
because if you look at it, everybody's a thought leader today yeah. and nobody has the attention span of more than 30 seconds, yeah. right? So coming from those two angles, uh, the first and foremost thing is what is the topic that you want to write about, right? That will not only uh, get the viewer's attention mm-hmm. or the audience's attention, um, but has a hypothesis that is uh, provocative out there uh, that people want to sort of talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's the first step. And, and there's no science to that that I've been able to come up with. It's, yeah. it's sort of a lot of your gut feel. Yeah, and talking uh, to a lot of people. Lot, and what, talking to a lot of people. What they're interested in learning yeah, about. Uh, uh, it, it's a little bit of a push and pull in yeah. my way. Uh, and I think that's what we spend a lot of time is designing the research agenda, right? So what is it that we should write about? Mm-hmm. What is it that we should not write about? Because you can cover pretty much anything yeah. under the sun. Uh, so I think that's the first step is designing the research agenda. And then once you have that, we follow a, what I call a hypothesis-led approach. Um, so given that we are out there in the market, and that's mm-hmm. one of the things that should differentiate a good analyst versus a good journalist, is that an analyst should have a point of view yeah. uh, of his or her own. Yeah. Uh, so you need to have a hypothesis. Uh, once you've got that hypothesis, then you go in and collect data from, from multiple sources, right? It could be... Uh, given I'm talking to the art of procurement, it could yep. be through RFIs yep. uh, that you roll out. Uh, it could be through client conversations. Yep. Uh, it could be through other market participants. Uh, usually what I try and do is uh, make sure that it's coming across from all different types mm-hmm. of stakeholders because that makes it holistic yep. versus, having a, versus having a bias of yeah. one versus the other. Yep. So, so look at different sources. And then it's simple, right? Then you try and analyze it, uh, see what makes sense. Uh, and one of the most important things is to take out the outliers because there'll always be somebody who's woken up from the wrong side of the bed <laughs> and has a really yeah. uh, <laughs> bad perspective on something. Uh, who's just frustrated and yeah. you need to take out those yeah, outliers. They're in the moment. They have they're something the, that happened something yesterday. Something that happened yesterday uh-huh. and dealing with a firestorm. Yeah. Um, and then present a balanced view, right? I think that's also important. So whenever we're trying to do it, we, we're not just focusing on the strengths but the challenges as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and and those are the three or four sort of best practices, right? I, I don't think there is a, it's it's not rocket science right. uh, at the end of the day. It's, it's what do you decide to write on? Do you have a strong hypothesis? And how much effort do you put in to actually mm-hmm. validate that hypothesis or, or, or prove it wrong? Yeah. Um, and, and try and be objective, uh, not have any bias. Right. And I think that not having bias is so important as well. Yeah. And it's something that, you know, is, is some, sometimes it's unconscious. We don't realize there is, but it's something we struggle with as well in procurement, just from a, a sourcing event, for example. You know, we, we want to make an evaluation on data, but there's always some biases that may exist in terms of what we really think. And, and maybe it's our own hypothesis. Yeah. Um, and it's difficult to strip that away from making an objective decision. Yeah. Um, so I wonder, like, as you build a report, how do, how do you make sure that that doesn't inform your results, you know, that you've taken that bias away? So one is the go-to market uh, that you have as mm-hmm. a firm. Mm-hmm. Um, so we at HFS are very clear that we are an analyst firm. Yeah. Uh, we are nothing else, right? Yeah. So, and I think that's important, right? Yeah. Because a lot of times you have these two or three roles that you're trying right. to play in the market. Mm-hmm. And even then, if you try and create Chinese walls between one versus the other go-to market, there is a perception. Yeah. That even if it's buying. only perception. <laughs> even if it is only a yeah. perception, but perception matters, yeah. right? It's not something that you can trivialize. So I think we are lucky in that sense, or you could call it st- strategy, mm-hmm. <laughs> that, uh, that we are an analyst firm. Yeah. Uh, and that's all that we are. Uh, that takes care of uh, some part of it. The other part of it is that everybody's our client, right? So mm-hmm. we have service providers who are our clients. Yeah. We have enterprises who are taking those services from our service providers who are our clients. We have advisors and other influencers uh, who are providing advisory services who are our clients. We have industry associations, mm-hmm. uh, SIG being a good example, yeah. uh, who are our clients. Uh, so I think that also nullifies the bias because you're not trying to please one, st- yeah, you're one set of stakeholders versus the other. And anything you do to damage a relationship in one or, pers- or the, or the because reputation. It, you can say either either we can be completely unvarnished or we're yeah. trying to please everyone, right? Yeah. Which, which both ways you're <laughs> trying to uh, take out the bias. Mm. And then I think the third and perhaps the most important thing is to have a one-to-many mm-hmm. model, right? Uh, not have... Uh, 
uh, either your revenues or the way that you're measured uh, so significantly impacted by yeah. one organization yeah. in either of any of these yeah. stakeholders uh, that there is an inherent bias yeah. uh, that comes in, right? right? Even if you're trying not to. So I think I think those are some of the things uh, that, so I think the bias really comes from the go-to market, mm-hmm. uh, despite what people say. Right. Uh, but I think it has to be the strategy, right? Of how do you go to market and what is your... Uh, what is your principles and how do you make money? Uh, I'll be honest, we are yeah. all in the business to make money, yeah. right? so we're not doing academic right. research. Right. Uh, but uh, but how do you make money is important. Yeah, and how is that informed? So when I think of HFS, you actually mentioned it in, in your introduction, you, you're always kind of looking to the future yeah. as opposed to what's, you know, what's happened in the past isn't necessarily a predictor of what happens in the future. Not anymore. Uh, no, <laughs> and, and so a lot of that obviously today comes down to technology. Um, and digitization. And digitization, I think, is a term that we're bombarded with. I, I had an interview earlier today um, talking a little bit about that topic itself, you know, what's hype, what's reality. Um, first, before I even go there, you know, I'd like to know from your perspective, is, is digitization a thing, you know, in terms of it's an, it's, it's something has fundamentally changed, which means digitization is different from anything that has ever happened before, or is it just the continued evolution, perhaps, of technologies that already exist? It just has a new wrapper. It just has a new marketing name to make it sound interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah perhaps there's a little bit of hype around digital because any anything that you put a digital as an adjective before it gets a lot of viewership and mm-hmm. <laughs> all that. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's it's real also, right? I think we are. Uh, uh, I think the digital fog uh, that's been in this industry is starting to lift. It's yeah. not lifted completely. Yeah. It's still a little hazy, but but it's starting to lift. Uh, and I think to your question, uh, we actually interviewed uh, about 100 uh, C-level folks uh, mm-hmm. recently and asked them the same question, right? What do you mean by digital? Right. Right? Um, and it, it was a very interesting answer, right? So about a third of them um, said that it's about technology, mm-hmm. right? It's about technology investments, right? As, as you also mentioned, all yeah. different kinds of technology investments. But two thirds of them, which is pretty significant, yeah. uh, said that it's actually not technology. It's it's about creating an impact, mm-hmm. and the impact that they said was around three things. Uh, so one is impacting the customer experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one was creating new streams of revenue. Uh, yeah. And the third one was aligning or harmonizing our internal operations. So I think that's a good definition of digital in my mind, which is how can I create an impact of either customer experience or creating new revenue streams or aligning my business operations Mm -hmm. better through the use of technology, right? I, I think so if you amalgamate these yeah. results that's that's i think is a good definition of it's interesting show. and actually encouraging to hear that so many of the people you talk to kind of think of it in that way and that it's it's about driving outcomes and having maybe new ways of driving outcomes as opposed to i gotta go and buy the latest technology yeah, for the sake yeah. of buying the latest technology yeah but i'll also say that if you go so this was a c-level mm-hmm. <laughs> suite yeah. if you go down yeah this becomes less not, and less not evident. Not quite as obvious. This, yeah. this becomes less and less yeah. evident. And I think that's a challenge that we as an industry need to mm-hmm. sort of, you should uh, educate your yeah. audience uh, yeah. around that. Yeah, the fact that it's, uh, you know, there's one, th- we think of technology sometimes as being like the silver bullet. And yeah. you just, you have to get the fundamentals right. And the fundamentals being what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, but also the processes that you use today, there's no good in trying to bring, make make something that doesn't work more efficient through the use of technology, for example. Yeah, no, in fact, in the same survey, the, the two biggest barriers that people said of us becoming, in quotes, digital, mm-hmm. was culture. Yeah. Uh, and two was mindset or legacy mm-hmm. mindset. Interesting. Uh, Nobody said anything else, right? Uh, probably the third was talent, lack mm-hmm. of talent. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and not, none of these has to do anything with technology. No, it's all internal yeah. as opposed to the tools being out there. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could explain what Digital One Office is. So it's something I see a lot from HFS. Yeah. It's something that I think Phil and the team kind of crowned as a... Um, it's what's helping to drive a lot of the movement around digitization. Yeah. Um, 
But I just wonder if you could share a little bit more about it for folks who may not have seen that term yeah. or maybe haven't really dug deep to understand kind of the positioning or the uh, the hypothesis, I guess, that you are th- yeah. that is informing that. Yeah. So, so, so I think digital one office is our is our concept is 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 what is our you can call it our uh, purpose of life mm-hmm. <laughs> in a way uh, around which we are organizing our research uh, around which we are uh, uh, organizing our team uh, around which we are doing everything and essentially what it says is that for too long we've talked about all this front office middle office back office left right center yeah. all that kind of stuff but there is only one office that matters, mm-hmm. right? And that of that is the office that focuses on the customer. Yeah, right. Uh, call it customer or employee or uh, vendor or stakeholder, right? So I think that is the concept of one office, right? Wherein you need to collapse these barriers mm-hmm. uh, of front, middle, back, and just focus on the customer experience. And the way to do that is not organizational restructuring. Because we've all talked about these things. It's not a new concept from that perspective. But the only way that people attacked that was organizational restructuring and created enormously complex org structures Mm -hmm. which were never going to be sustainable. (laughs) Uh, But through through these new change agents that we've now started to see, uh, and these change agents could be technology or they could be uh, things like design thinking, uh, you can actually integrate uh, these silos. Um, and that is what this digital one office talks about, right. right? Is that you have a customer centric front office, you have all these support functions, mm-hmm. but you need to have a digital underbelly which has automation, which has cloud, which has which is secure. Yeah. That is the infrastructure of of connecting these yeah. two, and then you have intelligent processes through cognitive or AI or blockchain or IoT that sort of links it and you create that circular motion or, or, or a circular loop that can actually collapse these barriers mm-hmm. pretty much and you can really focus on uh, the true meaning of digital, right, right uh, that we were just discussing. Who owns that infrastructure then? Or is, is there some area in the organization who ultimately are taking the lead on... on um, on building infrastructures like this, you know, that, that support that notion of digital, or is it each each one of these siloed organizations which we're trying to break down the barriers, but they still own a part of it, and, and there's just something that's bringing it all together. Yeah. So, so first, first thing that I'd like to point out is that this digital one office is more a concept. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, it's 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 not a five step process or mm-hmm. a three step process or what what have you. Yeah. It's a it's a concept or a vision, yeah. Yeah. right? Uh, that is useful. Like what a future organization, what a future organization like. could look yeah. like, or what it should be, or what's the purpose of life for for a lot of organizations. Right. Uh, and I don't think there can be one person. I, I I'd say there can be two or three things that we've seen is it has to be driven at the top, mm-hmm. uh, right? So it has to be somebody like a CEO or a COO yeah. or a CFO yeah. uh, or even a CIO yeah, but uh, who has this vision who has this vision and then it should percolate down <clears throat> because ultimately what you're trying to do is everybody who's trying to sort of it's it's a vision that can align everyone mm-hmm. right because what happens is procurement has this these performance metrics which they tend to excel at yeah. uh, business has their own performance yeah. maxi- metrics and often they don't talk to each other so if if you can align and give them the singular vision or a singular performance metric, then at least you've started the cons mm-hmm. the conversation around alignment. So I don't think it's it's going to be easy to identify one person in an organization to say that you own digital office, right. digital one office now. Yeah. Uh, perhaps somebody in the C level. Yeah, it's like, should, a, like a transformation initiative, it's, isn't it? it? It is a transformation initiative, but it it starts to give your organization a common language, a yeah. common lingo. Uh, to align with and then you can say okay the top level impact that I want to drive is is this yeah. through whatever I try and do uh, what's what's the role of procurement in this you know is it as a and I'm sure it's a bit of both you know I think of the two different dimensions one is internally in um, in leveraging some of these uh, I want to say it's it's not really concepts, but it's it's taking the vision and implementing them from a service delivery perspective. So how procurement supports the organisation, but also 
helping the organization understand what the market looks like to, to leverage the suppliers to actually enable it. Yeah. Which is the most important role or do you see for procurement? I, I think both, right? Mm -hmm. All of the above. Uh, one, it's a safe answer. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I genuinely believe that uh, because, look, at, at on one on one side of the spectrum, procurement is one of those support functions, yeah. uh, right? Uh, and they also, the procurement function also needs to have the one office vision. Yeah. Uh, that all that we're doing is for our stakeholder experience. Uh, only then the organization will achieve the one office, right? So mm -hmm. from, from one side, it is one of those functions or one of those silos that we need to collapse. Uh, on the other side, procurement has a very important role because it actually buys services and right. products for you. And in today's world, I don't think there is anyone who can do everything for everyone. Right? Yep. Uh, it's just not possible. Yeah. Right? Uh, and so you need to you need to create these ecosystems. Uh, every enterprise needs to have mm -hmm. this ecosystem, right? Which is a collaborative uh, ecosystem where I have a set of partnerships, <clears throat> not only for people who are providing me services. Uh, but who are helping me drive new business revenue, who are driving new uh, 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 sort of uh, business models yeah. uh, or what have you. And I think procurement is sort of front and center of that, right? Mm -hmm. of how do you create uh, the, that ecosystem. Uh, procurement has to be uh, the most influential stakeholder in that conversation. Yeah. So, so I think procurement is not it is important as a support function to mm -hmm. transform, but it is also an ecosystem builder, uh, yeah. which is without which you cannot succeed really. And that's a great term, you know, ecosystem builder, yeah. to think about what, I just what the role could be. You should <laughs> trademark that. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I think that um, for, 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 for folks who are listening, who, who share the vision, we're in a position where we can actually implement ourselves but then show as like a way of demonstrating the possibility and using that as the use case for other areas of the organization. So while we see the opportunity that exists because we're involved in the ecosystem and the suppliers more than anybody else in the organization, we see that more holistically. By doing it to ourselves is kind of taking the lead on helping others implement. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I think also another important role which is often overlooked is that procurement can be a great business advisor mm -hmm. in terms of uh, providing market alerts right yeah. of just knowing the provider landscape uh, and who's doing what yeah uh, there is no other knowledge source uh, that i can think of uh, who will have a very horizontal right. view of like organizationally, of organizationally, mm -hmm. uh, maybe individuals that. within certain pockets of areas who yeah, know yeah, yeah. a specific technology and but, how to price but them. But organizationally, yeah. right, that that layer of knowledge of what is happening in the ecosystem and who's doing what, yeah. of uh, supplier X did these five things and this is their strategy, etc. That all resides with the, or should reside with procurement right. and kind of scale it across all the categories exactly. that you have responsibility for. Exactly. Um, we talked a lot about, um, or we touched on automation, on um, AI, blockchain, you know, terms that are thrown around a lot within right. the industry right now. And um, again, it's sometimes hard to make sense of what's real, what's hype, you know, how far away is something, what should I really be concerned about or not concerned about, what, should, what, what provides an opportunity to really be a game changer. Hmm. Uh, when you think of the technologies that... Um, that are emerging or that, is, that are marketed as being emerging, mm. what ha has the potential in your mind to have the biggest impact um, on, a, on, a, on the way that an organization functions but also in value creation? So I think, I, I think the power lies in the power of and and mm -hmm. not or. Mm -hmm. Right. I, it's, so it's kind of collectively. It's a collectively because I don't think the business problems that we are facing today in most organizations can be solved by just throwing one technology. Yeah. We're going to put all our money in blockchain and forget about yeah, the and rest. forget about the rest, yeah. or everything is going to be automated yeah. uh, through RPA or yeah. what have you, or uh, machine learning will it's solve take over the world. The, yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think it has to be a combination of all these things. Yeah. Right. It is the intersection of all these technologies uh, and and if you can find those intersections mm -hmm. that is 
where the real power lies i call it the power of hand and yeah. not or and too often we all get into discussions of comparative discussions right uh, the biggest one is man versus machine right mm-hmm. uh, but i think a more healthy conversation is man and machine yeah. uh, right what what's the power of that yeah, what does that enable what does that enable or, that we couldn't do before to, right uh, so i think i think that's a, but it's also human tendency right mm-hmm. it's it's just how we are uh, you kind of compartmentalize you, as you well and compartmentalize um, all of them and then because maybe the complexity across each yeah. one of the technologies you seek to only learn about one yeah. and to learn more about one than the others so yeah. then you can feel as though you can at least talk intelligently yeah. about yeah. it yeah. as opposed to looking at them all holistically exactly and i think i think organizations should take given how rapidly technologies are evolving uh, because who knows we are talking about blockchain as being the out their thing mm-hmm. but uh, i've been asked this question on what will happen when quantum computing matures what will going to be the impact on blockchain of that right, right. <laughs> honestly i don't know right, right? but but <laughs> uh, but uh, but the one thing that i think most organizations should try and do when dealing with technologies is look at a three horizon mm-hmm. uh, sort of a strategy um, horizon one is stuff that is already mainstream and you need to act now on yeah. that stuff right robotic process automation is a great example of yeah. that i i don't think there is a question of what is rpa now but how do i implement it yeah. and how do i scale it up and how does it enable these it's more best practice kind of uh, questions that you should be asking now and if you're not then you're becoming a laggard yeah. to be honest uh, then there is horizon 2 which is more in the realm of artificial intelligence and all its different sub components of machine learning computer vision nlp nlg neural networks and all mm-hmm. those kind of things uh, and and some of them will start to become mainstream in i i think a couple of years right uh, and it is important for organizations to not say that i'll i'll go full hog into ai or i'll just ignore it mm-hmm. but it's important to pilot and test and experiment and sort of play with it yeah. uh, because very soon it might become the rpa yeah. sooner with the mainstream so, yeah sooner within mm-hmm. the horizon one and then there's horizon 3 right which is which is more r and d stuff right yeah. which is more investigative uh, things and blockchain is a great example of that right um, wherein you you start to sort of investigate that because otherwise i call it the in a couple of years i call it that you'll have the oh crap moment <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, right oh crap i i wish i had I should have done known more something about, about blockchain yeah. two years back and yeah. now i'm it's just too late yeah. uh, to the game and i think there's horizon 4 5 6 but then let others do that but mm-hmm. at least these three horizons if you can start to develop your teams and your strategy to because you you're you're right right you cannot be an expert on all of them right but at least implement something play with something and then learn about something i, I think if you just take it on those three buckets then yeah. it becomes a little more uh, yeah manageable comprehensible un- understandable <laughs> yeah. yeah i, I want to touch on i just get the horizon 1 and horizon 3 because it's like the now and then looking a little bit into the future so the now is rpa horizon 1 um and you mentioned the fact that for organizations who aren't embracing rpa right now there's a risk for them to pretty quickly become a laggard um what are some of the use cases that are that are, that are now pretty mainstream in terms of using rpa and if possible with the application of procurement but if not you know more to help us think more generally about if our company isn't doing this we should be making a stance internally to help our organization kind of go down this path yeah so there there are two there there are there's a spectrum right yeah. so with with all these things it's it's very hard to say these are the three the one best the two the, the, yeah. right but but i think on one hand you can use uh, robotic automation to to help the humans mm-hmm. do their tasks faster yeah. right and that's not a new concept right, right? that's uh, that's what excel macros did yeah. uh, when we were kids right uh, so it's sort of excel macros yeah, on steroids we're still trying to figure that out yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you can then yeah. it's similar to that right yeah. which is excel macros on steroids yeah. uh, which which basically helps you do your stuff faster uh, which is very powerful right mm-hmm. uh, it's it's not it's not uh, something that you want to throw away and on the other side of the spectrum is where you don't need human involvement pretty much mm-hmm. uh, right which is so we we call it the robotic desktop 
automation yeah. RDA uh, on one side and then robotic process automation okay. on the on the other side um, and then there's the third one uh, which sort of blurs into horizon 2 wherein you're saying that it's not only robotic process automation but it has some uh, elements of AI right. built in so it can, so it can improve uh, based on over the process time, it's doing right? and, and so let's say robotic process automation can get through 80% straight through processing yeah. through the uh, induction of AI or machine learning algorithms and stuff like that mm -hmm. you can get it to 90-95% right so I think th that's the spectrum right and then you can look at any process uh, where it can be applied, right? So in the in the procurement uh, case, procure to pay is a great example yeah. of that, right? Right from accounts payable to invoice processing to catalog management mm -hmm. to everything, right? Uh, there's there's so much swivel chair stuff that happens in procurement, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. You have one application, you copy something from that, then yeah. you paste it into another yeah. application. If nothing, RDA can help you at least copy paste yeah, faster, <laughs> <Right>? faster, <laughs> yeah. and and it's not the I don't think that's designed for human right. <laughs> intellect, uh, but but then you can start to automate uh, mm. some of these uh, things as well, right? Uh, and take the entire P two P space. But I think then again to to my earlier point, it's important to not just throw RP at everything, yeah. right? Because there could be examples wherein do we really need this step, and can there be a technology that right. can eliminate that step altogether versus versus just because RPA is nothing but a bandit mm -hmm. to your existing process. You're doing it the same way. It's just yeah, you some need to, ma macro doing yeah, it. Should we re-engineer our process Should we re-engineer our process or is there something else yeah. uh, that can take out the middleman, for example, or, or something? So that's where that Horizon 1, 2, 3 stuff that mm -hmm. we were discussing is important because if you keep throwing RPA at everything, then that might not be the optimal. Yeah, and you may be automating broken processes yeah. or just you, you, you're stopping thinking about the way that you solve a yeah. challenge in a particular way. Yeah, w One of the things that we've uh, realized is uh, we interviewed a number of uh, RPA clients, early adopters um, over the l last two quarters. Mm -hmm. um, and in general, most of them are happy. They, they gave it like a three on four, which is as good as it yeah. gets, right? Uh, <laughs> they're happy uh, they tried it. And they're, yeah, they're... yeah, yeah. But... I, I think the two or three things that they mentioned was was that it was much more harder to implement than we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, it took a lot of product configuration and implementation time. Then they, so it's just then not, it was it's not so, an easy it's, fix. It's, it's, it's not something that's a magic wand that will yeah. come and do it for you, which is one of the big learnings. Yeah. The the second one was that it's it's sort of garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So if you haven't done all the things that we've been trying to do over the last 15 years, Lean, Six Sigma, all those kind of things. You, it's the time that you should go and give your black belt a hug or something, <laughs> right? Because because of that, you can do RPA. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's going to be very, very hard. And then third, I think there is a little bit of an overselling problem wherein uh, the functionalities uh, that are being told are not really there. Right. Uh, so there is a little bit of a like hype, over promise over promising uh, uh, thing. But overall, I think it's it's a very promising um, technology. Um, and uh, I know HFS actually started this whole thing. We we called it Robotistan uh, <laughs> a, a few years yeah. back, and that uh, that name of uh, bots. Uh, has uh, unfortunately stuck it's with this right. <laughs> this uh, this thing. Uh, it it was done in a little bit of a jest, but uh, I think it's become one of the best uh, marketing uh, <laughs> <It's stuck laughs> uh, in, stories yeah. uh, that we've had over the last few years. Um, uh, there's a couple of follow-up questions I wanted to ask. Um, one is, you know, you talked a little bit about sometimes there can be an over-promising of capabilities. Are there any particular red flags that anybody should? look out for which you know immediately set off the alarm bells to to question whether um, a company has the capabilities that perhaps are warranting I think just common sense mm -hmm. usually works <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so there are people who will come and say that you'll have a 300 percent ROI and uh, we'll be able to do it in two weeks yeah uh, or you'll just take two hours to get this thing done 
uh, your average Joe out there who's never coded anything will be able to get it done, mm-hmm. right? It just seems like too good to be true. Yeah, it probably. And it is. is. Uh, <laughs> right. It is the right yeah. thing, right answer, right? It is too good to be true. It. Uh, I, I think compared to legacy IT projects, uh, it is much much faster, mm-hmm. right? So don't don't get me wrong. But it is not a magic wand yeah. uh, that can just come in and you get stuff done. You yeah. you need you need proper planning. You need a project plan. You need to test it. You need to have ongoing governance around it because these bots can get broken. Mm-hmm. What happens if your process step changes? All those ifs and buts you have to sort of it is. It, a it's not just a black box that you turn on one day and you never have to yeah, worry about it again. E- exactly. So it. And plus, this is a very nascent space, right? Yeah. It's just been two years or three years, so best practices, etc., are still yeah. evolving. I know, but I'm sure there'll be a lot of suppliers that come and go, or that consolidate, and you know, a market forms. Whereas right now, it's maybe a little less defined. Yeah. So if you look at the RPA uh, market, right, I, we estimate that it's about a billion dollars, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty sizable. Yeah. Um, but only about 25-30% of that is software. Right. So yeah. 70-75% of it is services, mm-hmm. right? Which is... It's the people. It's <laughs> the people element of implementing it. Yeah. Uh, and that is the reality that if you're buying RPA, you need to realize it's that you're not just buying a software, but you're buying a solution, yeah. which will also need people yeah. and expertise and yeah. all that. You're not going to go from 100 people to half a person overnight, overnight by yeah, uh, implementing yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and the, the other question I had was around, um, you talked about the survey and the interviews with early adopters. I just wondered if there's anything that kind of that binds those. You know, is, is there something that I'm thinking culturally or organizationally you know, for because I'm sure that a lot of people listening on a personal level really want to go and, and explore and experiment, but their organizations, you know, it may be difficult to do so. So are there common traits or themes that run across these organizations who happen to be the more successful in being early adopters? I think most of, most of these organizations were a little paranoid mm-hmm. uh, about what's going to happen yeah. to them. So if, if I look at the same study, and, and we've got multiple studies now which sort of point to the same fact in different ways. Um, so so one of these studies, which I can recall now, is um, we, we basically interviewed whatever, a bunch of about 400 different uh, business executives, senior VP plus kind of yeah. people. Um, and then we knew their enterprises, right? So we, we could actually classify them as these are the ones which are performing well on uh, revenue growth and profit margins mm-hmm. versus these are not performing that well, right? So we basically s- segregated them as top quartile, bottom quartile, right? Uh, and we asked them the same questions, right? And the people who said that, oh, I'm, I'm super worried that digital disruption will will change us or will not survive or... Uh, or our culture is not good enough yeah. or we need to be uh, really doing something urgently we're not doing enough um, versus people who are a little more complacent uh, mm-hmm. that no I think we're doing digital w- disruption will happen to others yeah. we have a solid thing we are growing etc yeah. uh, the more paranoid people uh, or folks were the higher performers yeah they're embracing it and wanting to because they fear the impact of not doing it yeah so i think i think uh being a little maniacal or Mm -hmm. paranoia is is a good thing uh now it's how you channelize that also is important but uh but it is a good thing than just being uh, sort of a deer in the headlight, right? Yeah, waiting to kind get... of waiting, and then all of a sudden it comes up, and it's a big, yeah. it's something to be addressed immediately rather yeah. than kind of getting ahead. Yeah. Of it. So I, I think the other traits that you can think of are these are more risk taking yeah. organizations, yeah. etc. But that's that's obvious, right? right. Uh, yeah. To even embrace something like this to experiment. To experiment. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing was there was a tone from the top that mm-hmm. is always required. I think it's very hard to do it bottoms up yeah. uh, if you're looking for real change uh, so tone from the top uh, having a uh, um, having a real earth shattering moment mm-hmm. uh, right in terms of either we've been divested or we've been acquired or there's a big leadership change yeah. or 
or something some event of some, some sort. event which catapults right. the whole existential crisis exactly, or something exactly yeah. is 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 sometimes helpful yeah. <laughs> i know it's coming up to time to wrap up but i wanted to talk a little bit before we uh finish out on the third horizon which is on blockchain and obviously it's talked about all the time in the news right um how far away is blockchain do you think from being something that is um, a technology that is really going to start having an impact on how an organization operates not that far actually right, right? so i think most of the stuff that we've seen in blockchain so so first of all i think i'd like to clarify that there is this cryptocurrency stuff mm. right which is bitcoin which is all the what the frenzy yeah. is about of how do you rich get rich yeah quicker. how we went from uh, everyone became billionaires yeah, and then yeah, yeah. lost it all again yeah overnight. Uh, and then there's a more serious conversation around enterprise adoption of yeah. blockchain as a technology or a change agent right yeah. so if i leave the first one aside because i'm no financial mm-hmm. advisor to tell you which we'll the technology yeah. of blockchain yeah but if i go on the more serious conversation yeah. then i think the the last it it really started to happen in 2016 in my mind before that people were just saying what is blockchain mm-hmm. and these are the three simple ways of defining blockchain and understanding it uh, but i think 2016 onwards we've seen i think blockchain tourism starting mm-hmm. to happen right where where people are going to all these solution providers and service providers and I love that term. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so it's basically tourism, right? Uh, yeah. Can I touch and feel it? Can yeah. I actually see it? What, is what it does really? it look like? Is uh-huh. it beautiful? Is it bad? <laughs> what uh, and as a result in 2017 we saw an explosion in proof of concept and mm-hmm. pilots and uh, we actually looked at about 200 or 200 odd engagements. across 25 different service providers and uh, 90 95% of them were at a POC pilot mm-hmm. stage um i think 2018 starting 2018 you'll actually start to see live in production blockchains uh, i myself know about at least 10 mm-hmm. use cases where the organizations are really planning to go live in 2018 or very shortly yeah. um uh, and once that starts to happen then it's a call it a sheep effect or yeah. call it a cross yeah. the chasm effect if yeah. you want to be more people, eloquent right people uh, will start to see it people in will action start and get to more see confidence and in, get more confidence yeah. and, and there'll be some failures also right so it, it's bound to happen yeah. uh, that not everything is going to be successful but i think starting 2018 you'll start to see uh, i think i'm pretty confident because out of these 10 or 12 that i know of and i i, I don't know of everything right, right? so there should be others also yeah. uh a few of them should succeed and create real impact um, versus it just being a a, a buzzword right. without really uh, carrying any meaning or real impact Are there so amongst the proof of concepts that you have insight into and obviously you can't share a lot of what's happening but i'm just wondering if there's any generally accepted um, kind of use case yeah. that, uh, that that the companies who are investing in experimenting with blockchain is it to do a particular thing is there a particular use case that is the low hanging fruit for blockchain implementation or is it really all over the map no it, it, i i i think the use case is right now it's all over the map mm-hmm. right uh, it's every every use case is a blockchain use case but i think you'll start to find use cases uh, becoming more consolidated yeah. uh, and getting more defined um and obviously financial services is the leader in this segment uh, given their deal with money yeah um, and uh, so for example payments is is the biggest uh, sort of use case for blockchain but i think some of the more interesting uh, blockchain use cases are uh, global trade finance mm-hmm. uh, because right now you have a plethora of participants that need to come in uh, to actually make so if let's say i need to send uh, some money to my family in india yeah uh, and if i actually follow that money trail there are at least 10 right. stakeholders that touches that transaction yeah. that you're paying a f- transaction fee to okay and i'm paying a transaction fee it's slow it still takes if it's a decently large sum it yeah. still takes a couple of days yeah. uh, to get there 
uh, with blockchain it can be pretty much real time yeah. uh, with complete transparency with complete auditability with all that kind of yeah. stuff with less uh, transaction costs yeah uh, practically zero yeah. uh, so the the other one which is outside the financial services is supply chain mm-hmm. um, uh, so provenance tracking is a huge huge uh, use case for blockchain and and provenance tracking actually comes from the uh, from the world of arts so mm-hmm. for for all the uh, sort like of high valued paintings uh, artwork and wine artwork or... and wine right mm-hmm. um, wherein you you need to know exactly where a Michelangelo was from yeah. X to Y date and then who bought it and yeah. then exactly everything needs to be it was just recorded on paper or somewhere yeah. hopefully uh, because otherwise you cannot really prove the authenticity yeah. of it now with blockchain you can take that concept and apply it to apples and everything else mm-hmm. right so in fact walmart so everything in the supply chain you can you can track and trace yeah. it from source to consumer so like diamonds for example diamonds like is a great mind. example but not just diamonds you can do it like even for apples right, right. it doesn't need to be something that it has a high value it needs to be value. high value because yeah. it can be so cost effective yeah. that you can do it uh, walmart for example that's one case that i really like is doing it in china mm-hmm. testing it out where they can actually source uh, maybe apples or some perishables uh, from the farm to the consumer so if let's say a consumer if i eat an apple and say oh there was a worm in it or something yeah. and i report it to walmart then yeah. they can it, find they, where it came from they can find where it came from right yeah. now and the journey takes, that it took and the journey that it took interesting um, so so there there's a number of we can have uh, a one day conversation on this right. uh, phil but uh, it is real it, it, there's still a lot of hype mm-hmm. around blockchain uh, but it's starting to get more and more real as we as we speak so what should and i guess this for time has to be the last question but what what can the i hate to use the word average but, but you know and i think of myself as the average kind of um consumer of information on blockchain and where things are going you know not people who aren't involved are they cutting edge perhaps on proof of concepts but what what should we be doing to make sure we keep informed so that we are able to recognize when the time is right to start going from yeah. a concept to something that maybe I want to influence my organization to try as a proof of concept yeah so like every technology there is this 991 adoption challenge yeah. right where 90% of the people don't know what to do uh, there's 9% who are trying to figure out okay i know a little bit but where do i start mm-hmm. and there's only one person who is doing something credible yeah. right uh, maybe it's not that bad but it's the, you get the, yeah, the concept the, the concept for sure. right yeah. uh, and i think it's it's really learning from the next uh, body so if you're in the 90% yeah. first of all acknowledge that you're in the 90% yeah. right don't say that we are in the 1% which which it did beautifully right <laughs> now uh, and then learn from the 9% what did they do yeah if you're in the 9% learn from the 1% and the 1% they have to be the pioneers right they have to figure out yeah. something uh, but they've made that decision that that's the that, play, that's what that's they want the to do but but for the 90 and the 9 there are enough people that you can talk to and learn and they're they're getting they're getting more open mm-hmm. uh, to talk um, so to share their experiences to share their experiences right. and see where to go so it, yeah, i think it's and, and i'm certainly always on the lookout as well for listeners of the show to find use cases now so we can start sharing some of those yeah. um, because that gives people then the confidence of maybe going and trying and doing something on their own yeah Uh well sir I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Hey. Um if listeners would like to reach out, connect or just learn a little bit more about HFS, uh, where would be the best place for them to go? Our website. Yeah. Uh so we have we have a weird model wherein most of our research is available for free download. Mm-hmm. You just have to uh give in your uh, email ID yeah. and you can access pretty much a lot of it. Uh, and then you will have my contacts and my team's contacts awesome. and everybody else's contacts just feel free to reach out to us and we'll see what we can do to help you pretty okay, great well what i'll do is i'll include the link to the website on our show notes page for today's episode that's going to be at artofprocurement.com/hfsresearch 
That's artofprocurement.com slash HFS research. And one last time, Sareb, thank you for joining me. Hey, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me, Phil. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Art of Procurement. To find an archive of all past episodes, you can go to artofprocurement.com slash episodes. And to ensure you never miss another show, go to artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Mm-hmm.